when I see that they put every black man in the movies in a dress at some point in their career, I'll be connecting them down like, why all these brothers gotta wear a dress? That's happened to me. Certainly, Hollywood has provided numerous opportunities and successful careers for many artists. However, alongside these achievements, there is a belief that the industry has also hindered the careers of several actors, particularly those from the black community. There is substantial evidence suggesting that some have faced ridicule and setbacks in their career. The man is trash. I'm just... Period. A Twitter user took to publicly expressing her discontent with Tyler Perry's films, highlighting what she perceived as bias in his work. To amplify her critique, she went beyond mere text and created a video, which she shared on social media drawing parallels between Tyler Perry's films and what she described as subpar quality or trash. Her criticism extended beyond a simple expression of dissatisfaction. I'm not a Tyler Perry fan, so this is what I got to say. It's funny how he got all this money to do everything but the right thing. The woman wrote that Tyler Perry harbors a fear of white people, contending that this fear influences his creative choices and decisions in his filmmaking. Her comments resonated with others who joined the conversation, sharing their perspectives on Tyler Perry and his body of work. And this lets me know that he's scared of white people and he has to stay in this weird box. These videos imply that there might be a hidden truth beneath the surface. The question arises, what could be Tyler Perry's secret that has led some actors to decline working with him? And when I'm hearing all this noise, man, it was crazy because there were no black people on television before diversity became a thing. Tyler Perry undeniably made a significant impact, gaining prominence in the Atlanta theater scene and achieving box office success with his Medea series. However, Perry's journey has not been devoid of controversy. Speculation have circulated implying that Perry's ego reached a point where he clashed with influential figures, including someone as notable as Oprah. In the competitive realm of Hollywood, navigating success often involves employing a few questionable tactics, and Tyler Perry seems to be no exception. Mm -hmm. There was a moment where every movie that after the 90s where I had all these black hits, everything stopped for a minute. Every, all these, uh, when the CW and WB merged, all those black shows went away. Following his success at the box office, Tyler Perry ventured into television with his popular sitcom House of Pain. However, during negotiations for a lucrative syndication deal and a spin-off series called Meet the Browns, a controversy arose. Deadline reported that Perry had fired four writers who had requested union contracts, creating a contentious situation in the industry. Writer Terry Jackson told The Deadline, quote, We were good enough to create over 100 episodes, but now when it comes to reaping the benefits of the show being syndicated and having other spin-offs from it, he decides to let us go unless we accept a horrible offer. In response to the writer's room dispute, Tyler Perry took a hands-on approach, declaring that he would personally handle all writing tasks. However, Perry's challenges with unions extended beyond the conflict in the writer's room. In 2015, actor unions SAG-AFTRA and Actors' Equity took a stand, prohibiting their members from participating in Perry's stage play, Medea on the Run, due to his production company's refusal to sign union contracts. While Perry may prioritize profit maximization, his methods have not received unanimous approval within the industry. There's a camera on you, baby. There's a camera on me right there. Back now. behind you. Oh, hello. Oh, praise the Lord. Um, we like to tell everybody in Dallas that we are on our way. Thank you. In the wake of the success of House of Pain and Meet the Browns, journalist and cultural critic Jamila Lemieux penned an open letter to Tyler Perry, which was published by NPR. In her letter, Lemieux expressed her discomfort with Perry's use of stereotypes in his work. She wrote, quote, through her, the country is laughed at one of the most important members of the black community, Mother Deer, the beloved matriarch. I just can't quite get with seeing Mother Deer played by a six foot three man with prosthetic breasts flopping in the wind. Our mothers and grandmothers deserve much more than that. Heck, our fathers and grandfathers deserve more. Mr. Perry, you have told the Hollywood old guard to kiss your backside and I appreciate that, brother. But many folks have expressed some of the very same attitudes about your work that white critics have. Well, it seems like this is not limited to Tyler Perry. Many actors have talked about black actors being exploited by fellow actors. The authenticity infused into Outlaw Johnny Black goes beyond just sound effects. While maintaining its comedic elements akin to its predecessor, Black Dynamite, the film also delves into more profound themes such as faith and revenge. There are suggestions that Tyler Perry might have undertaken this project drawing from his own personal experiences, as the movie explores serious and contemplative subject matter alongside its humorous moments. According to Michael J. White, this was integral to doing the Western genre right. 
Quote, you want to do an homage to the entire genre, and a lot of things with westerns traditionally are connected with revenge, so that template is very much a part of this movie and the storytelling as well. So to do a western right is to make people feel like they are experiencing that same type of movie making that we're based on in the 70s. Revenge isn't the only dark theme touched on in Outlaw Johnny Black. The film also took inspiration from real life tragedies that befell local communities like Tulsa during the burning of Black Wall Street in 1921. Michael J. White wanted to use the format of the western, not just to tell the stories of these communities, but to spread a message of hope that they can be built once again. Quote, I base this on the Tulsa Massacre, the early days when it was called Greenwood before it was named Tulsa, and there were thriving communities all around the country full of free black people who created these thriving communities and cities that unfortunately were decimated by outside forces. The first real domestic terrorism, well not first if you want to consider what happened to the Native Americans, but it's just another story of the several stories that unfortunately happened. But in this telling, this is telling a time where communities were set up and how we kind of return to that and how, dare I say, we can do that once again. So these are the things I'm putting up on this type of platform. Serving these communities that have been traditionally disadvantaged seems to be a passion for Michael J. White. A statement from his recently formed production company, Gigantic Studios, stated that they want to uplift black and brown voices that have been passed over by Hollywood, which is much needed in this industry. When asked if he wanted to create an entirely new film ecosystem for voices or to have the studio serve as a springboard in their career, White revealed his passion was for telling the stories of underserved communities no matter the race. Quote, both. We're putting a little bit too much on Hollywood. The world has become smaller and you can create Hollywood anywhere you want. So yeah, it's just remedying something that is an imbalance. Whether the people happen to be black or brown is not the biggest significance, it's just that there's an inequality there. It's not a racial thing. It happens to be that these these people are underserved. These communities are underserved. These stories are underserved. So it's priority wise, it's that. And they happen to be black and brown people. Just like for me, a lot of movies that you see that I do, I happen to be a black man. But the stories I'm telling are universal. It seems as though Michael J. White is well underway in setting up his own community in New Haven, Connecticut with Gigantic Studios. When asked what spurred him to break from the Hollywood bubble, White revealed he thought it was the best place to tell stories that deviate from the formula like Black Dynamite and Outlaw Johnny Black. Quote, Well, the fact that I want to tell stories and I want to do it in an independent fashion as I did with Black Dynamite, I feel that I understand show business, it's called business for a reason. But there are basically formulas that they follow which I understand. But there's not many storytellers that are heralded for what they bring in the studio system. Acclaimed film director Spike Lee is one of the notable figures who criticized Tyler Perry for his use of stereotypical characters in his work. Lee is well known for openly addressing this issue with Perry. But I still think there a lot of stuff that's on today is coonery buffoonery. And I know it's making a lot of money. Spike Lee went on to suggest that because of these stereotypical movies, individuals like Tyler Perry were breaking records. In his view, the industry could do better by avoiding such biased and nonsensical movies that featured designated one-dimensional characters. Breaking records, but we could do better. Tyler Perry's approach to casting and character portrayal has become noticeable to viewers, leading to discussions about his business strategy. Some individuals argue that Perry tends to cast dark-skinned actors in villainous roles while portraying white-skinned individuals as heroes in his movies and shows. This perception has generated discussion and debate within his audience. Pitiful black woman being abused by a no-good, dark-skinned man and then saved and rescued by the perfect light-skinned man. If you ever want to know about history conspiracy theories, then turn to none other than comedian Eddie Griffin, who is a certified expert in it. Quote, a black history conspiracy. I don't know if it's a conspiracy anymore since they've released most of that information, but yeah, Martin Luther King used to have a thing with Marilyn Monroe explained Griffin. Yes, yes, oh, everybody got a piece of Marilyn. Yeah, that was Marilyn Monroe. Griffin has a Showtime comedy special called Eddie Griffin, undeniable, that premieres February 9th and the location of his special is pretty important to him. Quote, I tapped it in Boston at the historic theater where James Brown grabbed the hand of the man and had him put it together with some of the activists to make sure that the ride didn't go down the night Martin Luther King was Cade, explained Griffin. It's for the historic value, man. Get the vibes and the spirit, you know, explained Griffin. Eddie Griffin, 
who portrayed Eddie Sherman on Malcolm and Eddie, and the title character in 2002's Undercover Brother said that the US would be dreadfully embarrassed if the rest of the world understood the true statistics facing black men in America regarding the rates of incarceration. Quote, the criminal justice system is rigged against African Americans, the comedian told the observer in a phone interview. It's a plantation mentality. They are trying to lock up as many of us as possible to put us in penitentiaries for free labor. You have the government paying private prisons to feed and clothe each inmate, turning it into a damn business. And African Americans are set up for getting arrested. If you leave me with nothing but dope to sell, what do you think I'm going to do to make a living?" said Griffin. People are getting locked up for doing the only thing way that's left to make a living in their communities. Quote, racism is endemic in the prison system. A dichotomy exists in America's prisons between whites and minorities, agreed Steven Zeidman in a phone interview, CUNY School of Law professor and director of their criminal defense clinic. Quote, most prisons are located in predominantly white rural areas, where they serve as cash cows for the small towns they reside in, providing the majority of jobs and economic stimulus in their areas. So it becomes politically unpopular to disrupt the status quo. In contrast, the people being sent to these prisons are predominantly minorities from New York City or other urban areas throughout the state. Correctional officers also bring their own biases into the prison, either based on unfamiliarity, fear, or both. These biases can often manifest in the form of abuse to inmates with very little chance of retribution for the victims. Unhesitant to delve into controversial subjects that may discomfort some, Cat Williams has also openly addressed issues that have seemingly incurred the displeasure of certain factions within the industry. Multiple incidents indicate that Hollywood might be actively seeking to distance itself from Cat, possibly in response to his unwavering and unyielding stance on these matters. I'm gonna let you be a star, Lil Rel, but you ugly. <laughs> and white people don't believe in ugly stars. They think you have to be somebody that women want to sleep with and men want to be. You often hear that truly understanding the inner workings of an industry requires first-hand experience. Comedian Cat Williams recently provided some intriguing insights that shed light on this notion. Williams hinted at significant revelations concerning many artists' careers. We black, they say, oh, you don't even deserve that. So you get Kevin Hart, Lil Rail, Gerard Carmichael, all in a row, Hannibal Burris, just dudes that no woman would talk to. Kat's disclosure about his former idol might be surprising to some, but the subsequent revelation is even more shocking. He asserted that Steve Harvey, a favorite among many, has purportedly made a deal involving his, quote, soul with Hollywood. I think Steve Harvey's some stand up and now I'm a kissed this old girl who owned TV One, he used to kiss her ass. That's how he had the radio. Certainly, Cat Williams is widely acknowledged as one of the funniest comics of his generation, celebrated for his unfiltered humor and dynamic performances in successful stand-up specials. Despite his undeniable talent and recognition among Hollywood's comedy elites, Williams has not achieved the same level of mainstream exposure as some of his peers. A supporter noted, quote, unlike Kevin Hart, he hasn't embraced leading roles in blockbuster movies, and he doesn't host a show like Steve Harvey. Being hopeless, he once even said, quote, I'm just going to go ahead and announce my retirement from stand-up. I'm kinda done. I've already discussed it with my kids. I wasn't really going to do it on a Seattle street. I was going to Los Angeles and to do it in the offices of ICM or Live Nation. Persistent rumors have circulated suggesting that Cat Williams had been blacklisted from the entertainment industry, sparking questions about why he hadn't attained the same level of success as figures like Steve Harvey. It's worth noting that Williams and Harvey have had a strained relationship for over a decade, and there seems to be a significant reason contributing to their ongoing discord. Well, you know, to be honest, with you, Frankie, I didn't, I didn't know nothing about this concept. When the promoter told me about it in October, I shot it down, because that ain't how I've ever promoted a show. To understand the roots of their feud, we need to go back to December 2008 when Cat Williams openly criticized Steve Harvey before a Christmas season show. This incident marked the beginning of their conflict, which has persisted for over a decade. It's important to acknowledge that both Cat Williams and Steve Harvey have had disagreements with other comedians, and this particular instance was no exception. The genesis of their feud can be traced back to a public challenge by Cat Williams. He boldly asserted that he could surpass Steve Harvey and claim the title of the King of Comedy during during an upcoming New Year's Eve show where both comedians were headlining. I, now, I was on the Steve Harvey show, and Steve Harvey, who is going to call in at 5.45 and get the f***ing record straight. Reportedly, Jamie Foxx was also involved in this conflict. 
Fox, who was working as a radio host at the time, played a clip of Cat Williams dissing Steve Harvey, which likely escalated the feud between the two comedians. Quote, I want to apologize for what's going to happen, Williams said of the joint comedy gig. Quote, but the second time you get on stage, I need you to understand that that's your final time as the king of comedy. Water seeks its own level. You can't stop it, Playboy. It is what it is, so I hope you're ready. I hope you got a team of writers. You're going to need about six or seven of them. In response to the clip, Steve Harvey called into the radio show and expressed his bewilderment regarding the entire situation. You know, I've always been on tour with, with, with some real monsters, man. I toured yeah. with the Kings. You know, I've been on stage with Sid, DL, and Bernie Mac at the same time. On the significant night of the event, Cat Williams did not hold back, coming out swinging with punches aimed at Steve Harvey's comedy reputation while also poking fun at his clothes and hair. Addressing the audience, Cat Williams likely delivered sharp and humorous remarks about Harvey during his performance. He said, quote, Please give it up for Steve Harvey. He's one of the best we've ever had, Williams told the crowd. But he don't want no parts of this in no shape or form. I don't know why he came out here with all this money all spent on these tickets and talked about a lady in the audience for 15 minutes, but won't talk about me the way I getting ready to talk about his expletive made expletive. Indeed, Cat Williams didn't inherit fame and fortune on a silver platter. He had to construct his comedic empire from the ground up. Beginning in Avondale, Cincinnati, he meticulously honed his craft by gracing stages with stand-up comedy in diverse venues across the nation, from the bustling streets of Oklahoma to the lively platforms of Oakland. Fearlessly, Cat delivered his routines, refining his distinctive style through relentless hard work and unwavering dedication. You in the middle of a goddamn meeting. Hey, yeah, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the movie with you, and then we're gonna, we're gonna go back. Shifting our focus to Steve Harvey, he is widely recognized as a committed family man who places a significant emphasis on his loved ones. However, Cat Williams reportedly contends that Harvey is merely a charlatan, concealing his true self behind a carefully constructed facade for an extended period. According to Cat, opinions about Steve's comedic abilities vary significantly depending on the source, adding complexity to their relationship dynamics and influencing the public perception of Harvey's image. You have been the king of comedy as long as we've had one. Matter of fact, the whole phrase, king of comedy, can be attributed that you get off stage. Harvey is either celebrated as one of the funniest individuals on the planet or perceived as a celebrity with a less than stellar reputation. Williams has asserted that Harvey has some undisclosed issues, including rumors of mistreatment towards his staff. Persistent rumors have circulated regarding the renowned comedian and talk show host not treating his staff well. Additionally, after his talk show relocated to Los Angeles, Harvey allegedly sent a controversial memo to his new staff, making demands typically associated with tour riders. These allegations have added to the existing tension between the two comedians. I could not find a way to walk from the stage to my dressing room, to sit in my makeup chair, to walk from my dressing room to the stage. In the leaked memo, Steve further wrote, quote, My security team will stop everyone from standing at my door who have the intent to see or speak to me. I want all the ambushing to stop now. That includes TV staff. You must schedule an appointment. I have been taken advantage of by my lenient policy in the past. This ends now. No more. Do not approach me while I'm on the makeup chair unless I ask to speak with you directly. Either knock or use the doorbell. Steve Harvey defended himself by asserting that the controversial memo was an attempt to secure more free time during his day. He explained that the memo was sent to address what he perceived as a too lenient open door policy that had been in place during his show's run in Chicago. Harvey reiterated this defense a few days later while discussing the leaked letter with Entertainment Tonight. Look man, I'm in my makeup chair, they walk in the room. I'm having lunch, they walk in, they don't knock, he continued. I'm in the hallway, I'm getting ambushed by people with friends that come to the show and having me sign this and do this. I just said, quote, wait a minute, and in hindsight, I probably should have handled it a little bit differently. Cat Williams seems to have substantial grounds for his grievances against Steve Harvey. In November 2015, the author of Think Like a Man was embroiled in a lawsuit for purportedly backing out of plans to lease a private jet. This occurred after renovations exceeding $400,000 had reportedly been initiated, allegedly at Harvey's request. The requested enhancements included custom carpet, a reconfiguration of 
of the interior cabin from 16 seats to 14 seats, custom seat design, and new upper and lower cabin sidewalls, as reported by TMZ. He wanted two of the seats removed inside, so there were only 12 instead of 14. He wanted custom carpets in there. Williams has also alleged that Harvey, who starred as a high school music teacher on 96's The Steve Harvey Show, lifted the premise of his show from comedian Mark Curry. Curry starred as a teacher named Mark Cooper on the sitcom Hanging with Mr. Cooper, which debuted in 1992. The same Steve that went to go watch Mark Curry do his whole sitcom and then stole everything Mark Curry had, Williams said. Now Steve got a sitcom where he's the principal and he wears a suit. Williams also dissed Harvey's acting chops, skewering Harvey's claim that he didn't want to pursue a film career. Quote, you couldn't be a movie star, Williams said. There are 30,000 new scripts in Hollywood every year. Not one of them asks for a country blumpkin dude that can't talk good and look like Mr. Potato Head. There ain't none. You have to have range. The allegations and rumors surrounding figures like Cat Williams and Steve Harvey also raised the possibility that certain artists and executive producers may have been involved in harming the careers of their own community's members. Such accusations suggest the existence of internal conflicts within the industry that could potentially impede the progress and success of black individuals in the entertainment world. One person on the internet wrote, quote, the difference between Southern people as opposed to people People from the East and West Coast is very true. I'm black and am from the Bay Area, but lived in Atlanta for over 10 years, and the Tyler Perry characters and storyline is way more relatable to the Southern audiences because almost every Southern black person knows or have one of those characters in their family or neighborhood. Another one added, quote, Imagine an America where the ultimate privilege was height and shorter people endlessly complained about how taller people controlled the height power structure and greedily kept all the inches for themselves. Also, shorter people shame each other for cooperating with taller people. How some people also opposed this idea, saying, quote, Medea has always been my favorite. It may be stereotypical, but that's funny because I see my family in so many of the Medea characters. Yes, my picture looks like I'm white, lol, don't come at me. But my mom's side of the family is all black, and they love Medea, it's relatable. I think people should just be able to like what they like. Some individuals still may feel that influential figures in the industry have worked against the careers of these artists. There are many success stories of artists who have thrived in Hollywood, breaking barriers, and achieving significant recognition. However, systemic issues, including racial biases, limited representation, and unequal opportunities have historically existed in the industry. 